everyone. I'm with uh, Zeta Elliott, who is the author of Mother of the Sea, which I read this week and absolutely loved and have so many things to say about. Um, and Zeta has kindly agreed to participate in an online interview. So this is an author spotlight on Zeta Elliott. Zeta, thanks very much for giving me some of your Sunday. So oh my goodness, it's such an honor and so nice to have a Canadian who's aware of my work. I feel pretty invisible up there. So thank you for taking the time to read my work. You're welcome. I'm hoping that by sharing this video and tweeting it, we'll get more people all around the world, but in particular uh, in Canada, uh, learning more about your work and reading your work. Um, so I've asked for half an hour of your time, and so I'm going to try and be as diligent as, as possible as I can. So first question I have for you is to tell us a little bit about your work and how you got into writing. Wow. Well, I would say I'm a Black feminist writer. Um, I think I'm known for writing children's literature because I've written close to 30 books for young readers, but I didn't start it that way. I actually started out intending to write for adults and I wrote my first novel. I finished it in Toronto, started it uh, when I came to New York after graduating from college. So I went to Bishop's University in Quebec and when I graduated in 93, my dad had moved to New York City and he said, why don't you come spend the summer in Brooklyn? And so that was my second trip to Brooklyn and I completely fell in love with it. Uh, and immediately wanted to move and that wasn't possible. So I went back to Toronto for a year and I took some classes at York uh, and I started my first novel, One Eye Open. Uh, and then I went back to the States and applied to graduate school. And so got into NYU and was working on my degree and was still working with kids. I've worked with kids for about 30 years and just found that academic writing, it was fulfilling in its way, but I really wanted to finish my novel. And the more I did academic writing, that sort of theoretical jargon, it was changing my voice. And so I decided I was going to quit graduate school. And my director very wisely said, why don't you take a research leave and go to Canada? And I was like, I'm not going to do any research. <laughs> and he was like, that's OK. You'll be able to come back with your funding intact. And God bless him, because I did write my novel. And then I did go back and finish up. Good. And I was getting such a great response to the novel when I sent it out in Canada and the US. Every time I sent a query letter, letter to an agent or an editor, I got a really enthusiastic response, please send us the whole manuscript. And then there was just nothing. And I spent six months not writing, thinking I had perfected my magnum opus and any day I was gonna get that six figure contract. Uh, and when that didn't happen, I went, you know, I was working with kids, teaching them how to write creatively. And we were doing picture books. And so I made a few picture books to give them an example. And next thing I knew, I was writing 20 picture books <laughs> and started sending those out. And again, got a kind of rapturous response. Um, so it was really an education to sort of learn about the publishing industry. Um, I started writing plays. I went to Africa for a while. My father died of cancer. And so I wrote a memoir about that, Stranger in the Family. Um, I don't. I wouldn't say I write constantly, but I write continuously. And since a certain person who shall not be named got elected um, yeah. in fall of 16, uh, it gives me uh, a sense of urgency. So I find that I've been writing a lot more and I finish my projects. Uh, I tend, I try not to be precious about my projects because I know that there will be more. Um, and when you're at the point where you have, you know, more than 30 books, you can sort of relax a bit and trust yourself. And uh, that's where I'm at right now. Cool. Um, and, you know, I've, I had the opportunity to look at your website and to look at your children's books and your young adult novels. And I also saw the cover of the memoir, which is, which is amazing. Um, mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, you know, I notice that your books tend to have uh, Black, African American, um, I guess in your context, maybe maybe African um, protagonists, and that many of them involve elements of fantasy and magic, even in some of your children's books. So, what is the importance of the imagination to you as a writer, and, and why does it uh, take such a central focus uh, in your work? Well, I think um, if we didn't have hope, we wouldn't create. So, I think artists are sort of inherently up optimistic people. Uh, I know that when I came down here from Canada, my friends uh, used to call me Pollyanna 
and I couldn't believe how happy and positive I was all the time. They thought that had to be a Canadian thing, and maybe it is. Um, but certainly, I've been here 25 years now. Um, I've lived here longer than I've lived in Canada. And the imagination is vital because it was actually, I heard an interview with Nalo Hopkinson. She was talking about Afrofuturism. And she said, it's a radical act for Black people to imagine that they have a future. And when you've been up against the forces of annihilation for centuries, uh, you know, it really is significant to imagine how we imagine ourselves. And so I'm interested in history. My dissertation was on representations of rape and lynching in African American literature. So I tend to be backward looking. Mm -hmm. I don't write a lot of futurist fiction, but Afrofuturism in a way is really about the cyclical nature of history and time when it comes to black people. Um, and it's, you know, invested in writing about our experiences of alienation. I can remember looking at my dad's green card and, you know, it said resident alien. And I just thought that was hilarious. But now that I've been an immigrant here for 25 years, uh, I know exactly how that feels. You're sort of, you try to be in it, but not of it, but you get sucked in. And then using your imagination can be a form of resistance. And so for me, Teaching is a form of resistance when I can go in and help students to acquire critical thinking skills, critical writing skills. But for me, when I'm writing, the kinds of ways that I imagine black children, the ways I help them, the mirrors that I create in my books, in my stories, that's really important because I grew up, I don't know about you, but in Canada, I had nothing. I had no mirrors. I had the books of Ezra Jack Keats, Peter and the Snowy Day, I had those books, and that was because my mother was my kindergarten teacher, um, and because Ezra Jack Keats is sort of universally beloved. Mm -hmm. And then I didn't have another book with a black protagonist until I read Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry by Mildred D. Taylor. And the only reason that was in my public library is because it won the Newbery Medal, uh, and that's the reason it's still in print. Mm -hmm. So Canada didn't offer me very many mirrors, and when it came time for me to leave, I had um, in my last semester, my last year of college, I had my first black educator. I had never had a class that was led by a black teacher. Uh, and his name was Dr. Jerry Tucker at Bishop's University. And he was teaching a course called Politics and Literature. And he had us read Jamaica Kincaid. Yeah. And then it was sort of over. <laughs> I read Jamaica Kincaid that semester. My friend Kate, the only one of like three black women at Bishop's, loaned me Toni Morrison's Beloved. And Mary J. Blige's What's the 411? And as soon as I had those three texts, it was like, all right, there are other people in other places doing things that I want to do. And I think, uh, you know, in 1993, 94, Toronto really felt like a wasteland to me. I couldn't, I couldn't, you know that saying, if you don't know, you better ask somebody. I couldn't figure out who to ask. And I went to York to study, um, you know, courses on Black literature and Black history, and the professors were white. And I just thought, I want a different experience. So. Imagination helps you um, envision yourself in a different environment, in a different context. It helps you to imagine yourself as more powerful than perhaps you are in a, in a particular moment. And for me, I've always sort of believed that things can get better. <laughs> you know, whenever I was unhappy and I have mental health issues that run in my family, but you know, I come from a family of migrants and migrants to me are the ultimate dreamers as we call them down here because you're always believing that there's something better, you know, someplace else, and you just have to hold on and get there. Um, and that's basically what I do with my writing and with my life. So then with Mother of the Sea, uh, you know, what were you trying to accomplish there, given your, what you've said about needing to create a place, a mirror to see yourself? Um, I mean, my experience of reading the book was very much about um, accompanying a young girl in transit and seeing the resources that she pulled around her, including those within her and those outside of her in order to survive that and to transcend that. Um, right. What was your goal when you, when you wrote this? And it's, a young, it's, a, it's in the young adult section. It is. <laughs> which surprised me. Yeah, that's been um, contested. <laughs> yeah, so tell me about that. Okay, so last winter, I was contacted by a curriculum company and they said, we've read your work. We think it's fantastic. We're really trying to diversify our textbook offerings in the English language arts category. We have a unit that's focusing on science fiction and fantasy. And the students are going to read 
something by Stout Westerfield, like the Uglies, and then it was the Hunger Games. And they were like, we really want something to sort of complement those texts, but increase the diversity. And so I said, well, you know, I've been planning to write this mermaid story. <laughs> I could try writing a mermaid story for you. And the editor who had contacted me, young white man, said he was really um, kind of fascinated by the stories that were coming out of young migrants heading out of Africa and trying to cross to Italy. And, you know, so many people were losing their lives at sea. And it's okay. hard to understand why people would keep coming, um, knowing it was such an uncertain fate. And I just thought, so I want to write a mermaid story. Uh, you know, my idea of Afro-urban magic is to, to sort of move us beyond wands and wizards. And I had written sort of a, a joint essay on the Hunger Games where I talked about how frustrating it is to see white fantasy authors putting their white characters into scenarios that Black people have already lived through and or are living through right now. So there's that moment where Gail is tied to a post and stripped bare and he's being whipped. And I was like, been there, done yeah. that, and who had any kind of interest or sympathy for us, and who went to see 12 Years a Slave, and suddenly, because it's in the white imagination, it's, you know, interesting and, and so sympathetic. So I have taught the Middle Passage for many years. I've been a college professor for almost 10 years. I habitually show the Middle Passage scene of the film Amistad, and one of the things I ask students to reflect on is the depiction, the differences in gender representation mm -hmm. of trauma as it is experienced by men and women on board the ship. And so the women are being implicitly sexually assaulted by the sailors who are dancing with them. Uh, but then the men are, you know, are strung up and whipped and blood is flying. I mean, there's a lot of gore involved. And I thought to myself, you know, women weren't chained on board when they were above deck on slave ships and they were perceived to be less of a threat. But in reality, the documentary evidence we have at least indicates that women were participating, if not leading, slave rebellions on board ships. Uh, and because they were also being sexually assaulted and regularly raped, many were pregnant, um, became pregnant en route, arrived in the Americas pregnant. So the goal was to write a story where women were at the center of the narrative, women were at the center of the action, but also to invoke sort of you know, I get frustrated when there are narratives, of, heroic narratives where just one person rises up and overcomes. And that's, that's not sort of the African way of storytelling. That's not, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't operate on a communal basis. And I felt like there had to be a collective. So who was this young woman who had been stripped of her family, taken away from her community, her sisters killed along the way, She's only got this little girl to hold on to, and then the little girl is stripped away too. So she really sort of feels bereft, but she has this other power and she can sense the power underneath the water following the ship. And I just thought, you know, I, I'm interested in talking to young people about power. I think all of my young adult fiction, especially the deep, um, I want to talk to young women about what it means to want power, to wield power, the responsibility that comes with power. You know, it's very easy to sing along with Beyonce, who runs the world, <laughs> girls, but we don't, right? We absolutely do not run the world. Uh, and we have so many forces um, aligned against us. And sometimes when we get power, I certainly remember as a teenager, getting power and using it irresponsibly. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, even bullying people, which was not a good thing. Um, so learning how to use power ethically and responsibly, you know, the young woman, when she's confronted, when the little girl says, machete, <laughs> you know, and she's like, uh -uh, there's no way we can do that. We're slaves. You know, she, she really takes a collective effort and she has to have another shipmate who says, yes, I will do this with you. And then by the time the mother of the sea rises up, you know, she's ready. Um, so I was drawing on some myths and legends, the myth of Igbo landing, uh, the sinking of a slave ship, excuse me, not the sinking, the mass suicide on um, a slave ship just off the coast of Nevis, where my family's from. Um, and then the idea that mermaids are, you know, either they're these femme fatale who lure men to their death. I was kind of okay with that narrative, but the idea that a mermaid gives up what makes her a mermaid in order to be human and sort of surrenders her power to live on land for the love of a man. I was like, that's not the mermaid story I'm gonna write. Right. So it was a way to sort of have magic that was 
African inspired, um, that drew on existing spiritual practices and beliefs, um, but also refigured the traditional um, narrative around slave rebellions, which is that they're led by men and men make all the decisions and women just kind of run along. Um, yeah, I wanted to show a young woman kind of coming into her power um, and realizing that death wasn't, wasn't the worst possible outcome. I, uh, there's so many things I appreciated about the story, which I'll, I'll film in another video um, that I'll attach to this because I want to spend the time listening rather than speaking. Um, but I do want to talk to you about water, the element of water. I'm, I'm really interested in stories about water and stories about sea people and mermaids. Um, so for example, Nemo Hopkinson's uh, The New Moon's Arms and uh, Nnedi Okorafor's Moom and Lagoon. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, Delaney also has a, a story that involves um, people who live under the sea, Samuel R. Delaney. So, I mean, we've, our, our imaginations have been uh, totally um, taken by this idea of, you know, what happens in the water, what does it mean for us to have traveled along the water, and what does it mean for the water itself to be alive. Um, so you had a lot of different elements to work with, and you were, you chose to work with the sea, and to personify the, the sea and, and the water as a place. And I'm wondering if um, you could talk a little bit about, about that choice and, and whether water figured in the plot as it did on purpose. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, if I wanted to write a mermaid story that I knew I was going to be writing about the sea, and if I was going to be writing about the sea, I knew I was going to be writing about the Middle Passage. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Dion Brand's book, A Map to the Door of No Return, is my central text, my mentor text, so to speak. Um, and she talks about how, you know, the ocean in some ways represents the rupture, and it's what separates us from our place of origin, from a moment in time when we weren't commodities, when we were still um, able to practice our native cultures and speak our native tongues. Um, and so in some ways, the ocean, the sea is a tomb, right? It, it holds the dead. Um, and it's what, it's sort of the bridge between the two worlds, the old world and the new. And so that myth of Igbo landing, the fact that these enslaved Africans Africans would, and they're chained to one another would simply say, we're going home and just walk into the sea um, with no fear and with a sense that they could just traverse that space and then, you know, ultimately reach their destination, which is to go home. Uh, I've been working on an experimental family memoir for several years now. It's called The Hummingbird's Tongue. Um, and I presented a paper in St. Lucia at a Commonwealth Literature Conference and then Caribbean Quarterly asked if they could publish the essay. And in the essay, I talk about a children's book I read when I was uh, a kid in Canada by Margaret Wise Brown, who did Goodnight Moon. And mm. it's called The Little Island. It's kind of a bizarre book, but it won the Caldecott for the illustrations. And there's a kitten on an island, which looks like your stereotypical Canadian island, mostly rock, a couple of pine trees seagulls uh, but the kitten goes on to the island and the kitten catches a fish and says take me underwater I want to see your world and the fish says oh no 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 I can't but I'll tell you about it did you know that all land is one land under the sea and I've sort of been thinking about that and the ways in which islands and archipelagos collections of islands are sort of a metaphor for trauma and the ways in which trauma becomes about fragmentation and incoherence and proximity, the way that you can sort of see how everything was once connected, but now it's, it's dispersed and that's diaspora, right? So I think to write about the sea, to write about it as a space that isn't frightening, to write about it as a bridge, as something that connects you to who you once were, um, and to write about, you know, I, like I Googled images of black mermaids and you might want to give that a try and see I'm what comes up. That. <laughs> it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I really liked the images of Yamoja, Yamaya that kept coming yeah. up. <laughs> especially yeah. After mermaids. you scroll though, right? Yes. Like <laughs> You have to look pretty far to find Seriously. a woman who is not a double D with some little seashells covering her, her nipples. Wow. I'm not a little pimp. Um, but when I found the images of, of Yamaya with a machete, 
Yeah. Oh, there she is. Yeah. And then just started, you know, learning more about Emoja and what she represents. And of course, Beyonce was channeling Oshun at the moment. So people were really interested in talking and young people were interested in learning about African religions and in, in, in particular Ifa. Mm -hmm. And I just thought it would be fantastic because keeping in mind, I was writing the story for a textbook mm -hmm. for eighth graders. I was just like, you know, there's a lot of violence in Hunger Games, so I'm not going to shy away from violence. I didn't have explicit rape in right. the story, but, you know, I alluded to the sexual yeah. violation of the enslaved women. And I just wanted to, I wanted to talk about the power that exists within, within memory, in a sense. I mean, in a way, I feel like the young woman, she comes to remember who she is, and she does that by you know, investing her energy and protecting someone else, right? The things she wouldn't do for herself, she would do for that child. Mm -hmm. And then she's thanked in a way by the mother of the sea who says, you protected my child and I was always with you. Mm -hmm. I think that to me was really powerful when I was writing that conclusion. You know, I can call you by your name and I never left you. And mm -hmm. that kind of reassurance that, you know, there's an, uh, an op-ed in the New York Times this morning by Deneen Milner, who runs her own imprint. Um, and she is talking about how kids need more books, black kids need books about subjects other than Harriet Tubman. And I've written on that extensively. And I, for the most part, I agree with her, but I'm, I'm a person who writes about the past and I'm someone who writes about the slave past. And I don't find it to be a source of degradation. And I know a lot of kids do because of the way that it's taught. Um, and now that Black Panther is out, they're only going to want to be thinking about the future, but it's all connected. It's all part of a continuum. And I think we can go into the past and find empowerment and not just humiliation or degradation. And so that's what I'm trying to do with my fantasy fiction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, you've answered in your answers a lot of the questions that I have ahead. <laughs> so I want to ask you uh, one thing of all the books that you've written, and this is specifically a question for those like myself who have just recently found your work and who are hungry for more. Um, what are your top three favorite books that you've written? That is so wrong. You can't ask people <laughs> to name their top three. Just I was just in Scotland last week and the kids are like, what's your favorite book? I'm like, that's like asking a parent to name their three favorite kids. <laughs> like, uh -huh. um, I would say if someone was interested in, in exploring more of my work, and I'm going to say if this is an adult, so if you're an adult and you read Mother of the Sea and you'd like to read more, I would say read The Deep, which is not set at sea, but is set underground. So I would say The Deep. Uh, which is kind of my black girl superhero mutant book. And I'm about to publish the sequel to that, The Return, okay. um, which is set uh, in Senegal at um, Gore Island. Nice. Um, so the deep, I would say I wish after midnight. If you're interested in time travel, I discovered Octavia Butler's Kindred too late. Like I had already graduated from college by the time I read that book. And if I had read that as a teenager, Boy, Canada, <laughs> there would have been another Angelique situation. I probably would have burned some shit down. Um, it would have radicalized me. And so I wrote a, a time travel novel that hopefully would radicalize uh, young readers. So The Deep, I Wish After Midnight. And one more. Gosh. So hard. I would say I Love Snow. Okay. So if you have... Um, because for Canada, where winter doesn't end until May, <laughs> if you loved Ezra Jack Keats's The Snowy Day, then I Love Snow would be a good book. Um, and it's really accessible. It's great for little kids. It rhymes. Um, I have tons of books. That was really, really hard to just pick three, but I think that would give people kind of a sense of the range of my, my work. You did it, see? <laughs> there you go. Um, <laughs> Okay, so now I'm going to ask you a lightning round of completely um, silly questions that, well, not really silly, but, you know, like little sort of get to know the human um, behind the author questions. Let okay. me find them because um, I think I just, I may have actually just deleted them, which would be less than <laughs> That's okay. We could talk about Black Panther. 
Well, one of them was Black Panther. So who was your favorite oh. character in Black Panther? Oh my goodness. Again with the like. Oh, the wow. favorites. Oh wait, no, I, I saved it on my computer. Yeah, who is your favorite character? Okay, if you feel like that's too much pressure because you're, you just loved everybody. Um, so well, I didn't love everybody. Okay. <laughs> I think- Who character inspired you the most? Or when you're in the theater, you're like, oh my gosh, that person or that moment. Ah, uh, you know, that movie was so complicated. I know. I didn't like Killmonger. Yeah. <laughs> But I certainly have thought probably more about him than any other character since the movie ended. Yeah. Um, loved Okoye. <laughs> yes. Was pretty sad that, uh, is it Ayo? Ayo, Florence Kasumba's character? Yeah. Who had the lesbian relationship that got cut, um, you know? <laughs> like, out of all the Dora Milaje, all not that, not that we said, needed right? to see a Dora Milaje get slain, right? but like, really? But then, you know, Daniel um, Kaluuya, uh, that was the best meme on Facebook, was a picture of him in Get Out sitting mm -hmm. next to Rose, his white woman. Seen it, yeah. And a picture of him sitting next to Eric Killmonger in Black Panther. And the caption was, when discernment isn't your gift. <laughs> <laughs> Because <laughs> I can't stand him. He said so many problematic things just as a person, but then yes. he's so convincing in those roles because yeah. you really think, yeah, he's just clueless. Yeah. Like he really just doesn't get it. Um, it was just, you know, it's such a visual treat to watch a movie like that. But I think the character I came away thinking the most about was definitely Eric. Okay, cool. I like how you changed the question, which I think is absolutely <laughs> Well, well done. <laughs> um, okay, so of all the, okay, maybe I'll, I'll stay away from favorite questions and like more like, what do you like better, which is kind of like a favorite question, but um, okay. Caravana or the Toronto International Jazz Festival? Oh, wow. Well, for someone who hasn't lived in Canada for 25 years, you know, the funny thing is that Caravana, I was just, I just wrote my first couple of picture books that are set in Canada. And I had to look up the date where Carab when Caravana began. Mm. Um, and I remember my father taking us to Caravana in the 70s when I would have been like maybe 77. I would have been five or so, five or six. And it was down University Avenue. I remember and that. There were no barriers. No. Nope. And I remember him just getting, you know, getting close to one of the big trucks and just putting me on the truck <laughs> with the steel drum players and everybody being covered in glitter and... I remember being like sort of terrified because he put us on the truck and then left. And I was like, oh my God, where's my father? <laughs> um, but at the same time, just feeling really safe. Like this is this magical moment that has never ever happened before in my life. And, wow. and I guess never really happened again because the next time I went to Caravana, I was uh, maybe 19 or 20 and I went with my older sister. And I could not believe the level of harassment, sexual harassment that was going on. Yeah. And I vowed I wouldn't go back again after that. Mm. So unfortunately, I do love jazz um, and would probably enjoy the jazz festival very much. But because of that early memory of Caravana, I'll go with Caravana. Yeah, I'm, I'm, finding, I'm finding my way as well in Caravana, certainly as a queer woman, you know, yeah. hypersexual space, hyper heterosexist space, you know, how, how do I enjoy the power and the magic? Um, that is present in Caravana and all, you know, celebrations of mass, you know, in the diasporas and also um, right. home in the Caribbean, you know, there's, there's also that, that part to contend with. So like, like you, I have mixed, certainly um, mixed emotions, but I am trying yeah. to play mass um, one day soon. I've never played mass before. Ah, uh, neither have I. <laughs> yeah. um, so uh, rainforest, beach, mountaintop, or meadow? and why? Meadow, because mountaintop is cold and how are you gonna get up there? <laughs> I'm not hauling myself up to the top of a mountain. I have been to Banff, it's very pretty, but don't need to do that again. Okay. Um, I am not a tropical girl, I have to say. I was in Nevis doing research on that family memoir a while ago. And I said to one of my cousins, she said, oh, have you been enjoying your hotel? It's right on the beach. And I was like, well, that's not why I chose it. I'm really not a beach person. I don't understand laying out in the heat, baking, 
And she was like, now I know you're in a vision. Uh -huh. <laughs> she said, the visions really aren't about laying on the beach. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, I know a lot of people from the Caribbean who don't swim. Yeah, many. Like, yeah. Yeah. The idea of just, I don't know. So now I'm not a tropical girl, so not the beach, but a meadow is sort of that kind of temperate, very green potential for flowers, maybe some rolling hills, um, small creatures <laughs> that are non-threatening, non-menacing. Um, yeah, meadow. Cool. And um, in terms of magic, and this is something that I'm just interested in myself and I've never really talked about it on the channel but enlightenment versus endarkenment um and the reason I ask that is because I've you know I read the Harry Potters and I've I've read you know a number of the fantasies and I loved what you said about um you know magic and fantasy being more than wizards and wands right and I've read a lot of the wizards and wands stuff and then and a lot of it is about the light conquering the darkness. Um, but when I once I started reading uh, African African science fiction, Afrofuturism, um, we start seeing that you know the dark gets explored right as a place of power and a place of goodness and nourishment, like the darkness of the womb, for example. So curious about your thoughts about enlightenment and endarkenment, and whether or not they're like opposites. Yeah, well, it's definitely a convention that needs to be critiqued and, in my opinion, worked against, actively, consciously worked against. I'm so excited because my friend, Professor Ebony Thomas at Penn, is about to publish The Dark Fantastic. Ooh. And she has some really, yeah, a blog by the same name. So check her out and follow her on Twitter, Ebony okay. Elizabeth Thomas. Okay. Um, and so she's definitely doing some work around reframing. Juno Diaz has clearly done some work around reframing, although we had a couple of issues with his picture book, Island Born. Um, for me, one of the last books that I published was The Phantom Unicorn. So everybody, if I say unicorn, you get this beautiful image of a you know pure white horse with a horn, blah, blah, blah. But for me, by the end of the novel, the unicorn is turned black. Um, there's an enchantment to protect it, to keep it safe. And that means turning it ebony. Um, and so I definitely find myself, I catch myself when I have token moments because <laughs> I've read, consumed so much British fantasy fiction that it just slips out before you know it. Yeah. Um, and I love how Nalo also said, you know, there's a kind of shorthand that, get, that happens with Western European magical traditions because you can just say werewolf and everybody knows what you're talking about. Um, but it becomes much harder when you're trying to signify on African um, symbols in part because I don't know them, <laughs> because I wasn't raised to know them because of that rupture of the Atlantic Ocean, the slave trade. Um, so the dark is definitely a space of possibility. When I was in graduate school, I remember writing an essay, reading an essay by Evelyn Hammonds, where she talks about black holes being not spaces of absence, but spaces that are actually very full, packed full of matter. And you just have to have the right tools in order to know how to detect a black hole and then navigate it. Um, and that was a really powerful kind of framing for me of blackness. Um, and the idea that, you know, we're in some ways we're absent from a lot of fantasy fiction and in other ways we're figured as the demon, the sinister, the sinful, you know, when people all say something critical and they'll go, wow, you know, you got really dark there. And I just think, <laughs> You know, it's like trying not to use, um, it's like sanism, like trying not to say, wow, that's crazy. Like we have to start thinking about our language and the ways in which we're signifying in ways that are counter to our own well-being. Um, and we're not modeling good behavior for our kids as well. So certainly in my fiction, I'm trying to sort of not necessarily reverse the conventions, but at least address them head on, expose them at the very least. Okay. Well, thank you very much for sharing so much of yourself and, you know, letting me ask you those questions um, that went a little bit beyond uh, the book itself. Um, I'm going to be uh, doing a review of Mother of the Sea as well. And um, I mean, the spoiler, I loved it. So <laughs> that's the answer. Um, and I'll be sharing it with uh, all the folks on um, 
on Onyx pages. And if you look in the comments of the videos, um, there have been a number of people who have said, I've purchased the book, I haven't yet read it, or I've been oh, reading wow. it, I'm glad that it's out. Um, right. So it's already, you know, people are already starting to, um, you know, get more people are starting to get excited about it. So I just want to thank you very much for creating it. Thank you for this gorge for, you know, what led to this gorgeous cover art. Um, Christina, she knocked it out of the park, boy. <laughs> Mervold? Mervold. Mervold. She's Norwegian. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's it's beautiful. And just like having a cover like this exists, like even if you don't read it, which everybody right. obviously should because like it's right. um, <laughs> But being able to just see this powerful, dark, beautiful force with the machete, yeah. Um, the, like the, you know, like the nurturer, um, but also, you know, the, the disciplinarian, lawyer, the disciplinarian, the protector, um, yeah. and the full moon, like there's just so much in this art. It's gorgeous. So, um, Thank you. I'm you so know, covers are a big deal in really young adult lit because so many people will use a silhouette in order to make their book racially ambiguous because the feeling is if you put a, an, a visibly identifiable black person on the cover, then it'll limit your reader. So I'm, uh, because of whitewashing in publishing and the tendency to try to conceal the race of uh, the protagonist, it's really important to me that my books are explicitly um, depicting powerful black girls and black women. Uh, I don't, I'm not concerned if white readers think, oh, this isn't for me, because guess what, maybe it's not. Um, and I really want, you know, especially young black girls. I never saw books like that in a public library <laughs> in Toronto when I was growing up. Um, and I know my books aren't in the Toronto Public Library, but we're like you said, we're that. working on that. Oh, okay. <laughs> on that. I, think, um, I think what you're doing is just amazing. Like, I'd love to know what inspired you to get started. And you know, if you wanna send me a link, if you've covered that elsewhere, uh, I just, I wish I had had something like the service you're providing when I was younger because I did feel very disconnected and I was a reader. And once upon a time, I'm, I'm gonna be 46 this year, so when I was a teenager, to be a black nerd was to be alone. And now we have all these different ways of connecting and community building and finding each other on social media and conventions. I hear Toronto now has like a black comics convention. I could never have imagined that happening. Um, mm -hmm. So I think the work you're doing is helping to build and sustain community. and. That's such a gift for an author like me, certainly, but I, I'm sure it is for all of your readers and followers too. Thank you. Thank you for your compliments. Um, this is this author spotlights are just one of the most um, beautiful parts of, of what I'm doing. So um, so I thank you very much. Well, I'm honored. Thank you.